a more developed ecclesiology, and a more realized eschatology. These differences have led many scholars, though not all, to view Colossians as a pseudepigraphal writing. I assume a pseudepigraphal work here for the sake of time. I'm not going to get into the arguments or the discussions on that. I'm just going to move forward and let's assume that it is a pseudepigraphal writing, and as such, what is going on here mnemonically. Uh, and as a pseudepigraphal work, Colossians is, as Jan Osman describes, a quote, a legitimate strategy in the battle of memories, end quote. I will be looking at Colossians in this way. Uh, so this is the plan that we're going to go through. We're going to talk about social memory, uh, resurrection, uh, as it was received by Paul, and then produced or constructed by Paul, and then moving on finally into Colossians, where we look at uh, similar reception and production within that letter as well. And then we'll talk about the afterlife of Paul. Um, yeah. um, if, if you're trying to write that down, uh, too bad. Sorry, not sorry. <laughs> as is well known, most applications of social memory begin with Maurice Hobwox's observation that memory is a social phenomenon. In New Testament's memory, social memory applications, this then leads, typically, to the demarcation of the field into two camps, continuitists and presentists. As helpful as this division might be for introductory explanations, there are many shortcomings with seeing these two sides as mutually exclusive, at least in any extreme sort of way. I don't want to spend too much time on it here, but suffice it to say that the two perspectives are better understood not as mutually exclusive, but as two sides of the same coin. In this, they simply have different focus. Uh, with the continuists focusing on how the past, and for a lot of them it's usually the actual past, influences the present, whereas the presentists focus on how the present influences the past. But as Jeffrey Olick has argued, the two can complement each other and provide a fuller description of the act of remembering. This paper is an attempt to do just that. So to borrow Michael Schutzen's phrase, and alter it ever so slightly, this paper's use of memory will consider both the present in the past as well as the past in the present. Rafael Rodriguez, who is up above here on the, on the screen, he summarizes it this way. The past is reconstructed in the present, yes, but the past is also retained in the present because the remembering present is itself constituted by the past it seeks to remember. End quote. However, there is a danger in using continuity to speak of the actual past. As Thomas Athena notes, and I quote, while the present can be affected by the actual past, it can also be affected by a stable image or tradition that did not originate in the actual past, but was simply accepted over time as true, end quote. For this reason, the past that is remembered is a perceived past, an imagined past, or in the language of Johann Osman, a remembered past, which is not necessarily the actual past. Moving on to identity. The product of social or collective memory is nothing less than the formation of identity. The past provides effective resources for defining identity in the present. We are what we remember, the saying goes, as Jan Osman notes though. This should be supplemented with another saying. We are what we belong to. This is connective memory, as Asman calls it, and it provides individuals the mnemonic space to locate their own personal identities, and thus it grants one that powerful feeling of belonging. The Pauline expression, in Christ, is a great example of a connective memory. It is a symbol or a space wherein one can retrieve the group's values and norms of behavior, and it prompts formative narratives such as a gospel story. A connective memory is both formative and it is normative. Formative in that it tells the individual who they are as distinct from others. It tells them their story that they live by and experience reality through, and normative in that it guides the individual how to live, and behave so as to belong to that group within that conception of reality. The past is thus an influential, influential realm of social cohesion. This provides anyone, especially one writing a pseudepigraphal letter in the name of Paul, motivation to reconstruct the past in order to secure his and his community's future. Though the present holds influence over the past, there are some limits or constraints we can talk about that should be talked about when it comes to reconstructions. Michael Schutzen explains, and I quote, not only are people's reconstructions of the past generally confined to the experiences in their own traditions, but they are further limited to those elements of the tradition 
that have emerged over time as especially salient." End quote. So a person reconstructing the past is not isolated from the very tradition that they are updating or altering. And some more salient events from the past are especially stubborn to change. Schutzen adds, though, that the salience of the past declines over time, making them more susceptible to change. But for our purposes with Colossians, which I'm assuming is that we're close to the time of Paul, the past should have much more of a social force and thus provide limitations on what is open to alteration. American sociologist Edward Schills notes that when traditions do change, they, not only, they are not always recognized as such by those within the tradition itself. He says, and I quote, Tradition might undergo very great changes, but its recipients might regard it as significantly unchanged. What they are experiencing is rather a sense of affiliation with a lineage of prior possessors of a tradition, which, in any two successive generations, changes by variation so small as not to be perceived as significant changes." End quote. So then I wish to look at the Colossal Remembrance of Paul as a change between successive generations. But I do not, take, I do not just take a continuity perspective as it has been typically described with the New Testament studies, which I see as too optimistic epistemically of one's position to make clear determinations on memory's authenticity. I say this in light of studies done on memory distortion, studies that tend to be neglected by said continuists. But I'm happy to follow Barry Schwartz's memory as a cultural system of meaning making, even though I don't agree with his epistemic assumptions. Applications of Schwartz's theory in New Testament studies, though, not all, at worst ignore the power of the present over the past in acts of remembrance, and at best just pay a lip service. This is unfortunate since social memory at its very core is all about how the present influences the past. It's the thing that Maurice Hobbox first discovered in a sense, or at least that's how we look to as the one that discovered it, and it's the thing that everybody seems to say, but as far as how people go about applying it, it doesn't always uh, make sense that way. Uh, moving forward, I will look at Colossians then as both a remembrance of Paul and both as both as an aesthetic of reception, and as Sandra, Sandra Hugenthal urges us, as an aesthetic of production. I'm also viewing the author of Colossians as a reputational entrepreneur. Uh, reputational entrepreneurs are those individuals who speak for historic events or persons, promoting or demoting them with the collective consciousness, within the collective consciousness. Gary Allen Fine describes it as this, and I quote, Reputational entrepreneurs attempt to control the memory of historical figures through motivation, narrative facility, and institutional placement. The successful reputational entrepreneur will see it directly in his or her interest and the interest of the community that he or she represents to shape the reputation of another in a particular way. The reputational account will be credible to the entrepreneur and at least plausible to significant audiences. That is, it will be claimed as true." End quote. Schwartz, who also works within reputation entrepreneurs and works off the fine, explains his use of the phrase. And I quote, the reputation entrepreneur's job is to make an ordinary person great, or more commonly, to bring that person's greatness to public attention, end quote. This is done by linking the figure's reputation to the cultural logic of critical facts, and then making that image stick in the minds of the public. Many entrepreneurs, moved by ideals, interests, and opportunity, all generated and influenced by the groups they belong to, work to promote a figure's reputation." End quote. Or, sorry, that was a quote from uh, Schwartz. Without this piece, the altering or shifts in tradition from one group's present to the next is left to be explained as though it happens through natural or evolutionary processes, as though human beings are not part of the process at all. It leads to linear models of transmission then, where one layer is assumed to be atop the next, and the historian need only peel back each prior layer. With the concept of reputational entrepreneur and a more dynamic view of tradition, I am able to take seriously Colossians as an aesthetic of production. As such, I will look at the author of Colossians as Paul's reputational entrepreneur, but for the sake of time, only as far as it concerns resurrection. I am interested in the interplay between the past that he received, as well as how he constructs a new memory of Paul concerning the Apostles' teaching on resurrection. Much more could be said that I have time for here, though. But one area that Angela uh, Stan Hartinger observes exemplifies how the author of Colossians is altering the reputation of Paul. She, like others, notes how in the undisputed letters, 
Christ's suffering and death is the representative sacrifice for the communities. Whereas in Colossians, Paul is now the sufferer in chains, who sacrifices on the community's behalf. As he himself says in Colossians 2.1, I want you to know how much I suffer for all of you, all who have not seen me face to face. And in verse 5, Paul says, though I, I quote, for though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, end quote. This and other verses in Colossians seem to imply an absence of the apostle for the community. And this letter, among other things, could be read as a way of overcoming that absence. So now I'm going to shift to talking about resurrection. And just briefly, but I think C.D. Elledge does a really good job, uh, what's the word, summarizing the, uh, the amount of Second Temple Jewish literature on resurrection, showing that, uh, well, showing that Richard Bauckham and N.T. Wright are wrong. Uh, so despite the conclusions of Richard Bauckham and N.T. Wright, that views on resurrection and the afterlife within early Judaism were essentially cohesive, C.D. Elledge concludes the opposite, saying, and I quote, the diversity of conceptions across the span of historical development in the Hellenistic and Roman eras and a variety of different literary genres thus resists standardization in many points of detail." End quote. He then goes on to ask later in his book about Paul's own theological uh, view of resurrection and how it stands in relation to contemporary early Jewish evidence. And he answers this, I quote, the evidence illustrates both continuities and departures from early Jewish reflection on resurrection which within a social memory framework, this is what one would expect. Uh, undoubtedly, where Paul departs from early Jewish beliefs on resurrection stems from his encounter with the risen Christ, see Galatians 1, and then uh, and the received tradition of the death, burial, and raising of Jesus, and is being interpreted as according to the scriptures in 1 Corinthians 15. That God raised Jesus becomes the new frame through which he not only experiences reality, but also through which he interprets God, the scriptures, Israel, and its past. In, in other words, everything. This is why he can claim that the resurrection of Christ is the most central, non-negotiable component to his entire gospel message. That without it, there is nothing worth proclaiming. See 1 Corinthians 5. Paul understands Jesus' resurrection to begin the eschatological period. Thus, he has an already not yet view of eschatology, but not when it comes to his view on resurrection. He holds that it is a future event, one that happens simultaneously with believers being bodily transformed from their earthly bodies into some sort of spiritual or heavenly body, which Paul argues will happen at the Perusia when Jesus returns. Consequently, for Paul, the return of Christ is imminent, and the distance between Jesus' resurrection and his own, <coughs> or those who are in Christ, is not very far off. Although many facets of resurrection within Paul's theology have continuity with his Jewish heritage, they are selected, combined, and produced based on his present experiences, especially his experience with the risen Christ. Colossians is similar. Much of Paul's beliefs on resurrection are retained by the author of Colossians, and thus there is a great amount of continuity that we can find between them. Four brief examples will suffice. First, and they're listed here on the PowerPoint, Colossians underlines resurrection for the purpose of encouraging moral behavior. In other words, resurrection is intimately tied for both uh, undisputed letters of Paul and for Colossians still as significantly tied to your ethical uh, behavior. Uh, second, Colossians posits, as does Paul, that only those who are in Christ enjoy or experience resurrection. In other words, Paul and Colossians doesn't really say what happens if you're not in Christ. So, in other words, there's not really any view of how. Uh, third, where am I? Third, both speak of Christ's death and resurrection as linked to the ritual of baptism. And fourth, both Paul and Colossians speak of a transformation of the believer from a lowly or earthly state to a spiritual or heavenly sort of state, and that this transformation will be completed at the end. In other words, Colossians shares with Paul that this transformation, the final transformation of the believer, happens at the end. However, Colossians does not put this within the realm of resurrection, whereas in Romans 6, for instance, it is precisely resurrection that seems to initiate or trigger this transformation. Where Colossians differs with Paul, we're going to look at Romans 6 now, which is what that is. Uh, where Colossians differs with Paul is on when the resurrection of the believers takes place. When Paul discusses the resurrection of believers, he does so using verbs in the future tense or in the subjunctive. 
See 1 Corinthians 15, Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 4, and Philippians 3. But I will look specifically here at Romans 6, 4 to, 4 to 8. Uh, and it says this, Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism and into death. Sorry. We have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk, so there's a subjunctive of peripate, uh, peripateo, in the newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, uh, and this next part is a little tricky, uh, the Greeks, alakaitis, anastasios, esimetha, uh, and I translate it as, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. This passage, uh, passage exemplifies the fundamental ambiguity in Paul's view of the resurrection. On the one hand, Roman asserts, Romans asserts that the ultimate resurrection of believers will take place in the future, at the end when Christ returns. On the other hand, baptism carries a present already meaning as it is the beginning of a journey to that new life. The initiate has begun this resurrection process then. Thus for Paul, the transformed body, which is as much an ethical transformation as it is a physical one, are both entwined together. I don't need to say together, but I guess. Of course, for Paul, this process was not extended over a large period of time, but was obviously imminent. Paul's thoughts here then left a tension between an already inaugurated but not yet realized sort of framework for understanding resurrection, as well as the transformation of believers, uh, transformation of a believer's body. As Uti uh, Lekipu remarks that this, and I quote, creates a special kind of hermeneutical potential that develops in different directions in the writings of subsequent Christian generations, end quote. These different directions can be seen within the Pauline tradition as well. But first we'll look at Colossians and then we'll turn to beyond Colossians. So the author of Colossians, in the center of this letter, develops Paul's thought in a unique direction for a subsequent generation. I assume an oral dependence between Colossians and Romans, though some have argued even for a literary dependence. Um, I'll get into that discussion at the moment, but I think there is some sort of dependence between Colossians 2 and Romans 6, whether it's oral or whether it's literary. It is interesting how Colossians differs, though, from Romans 6, and it says this, When you were buried with him in baptism, you were also raised, and that's the heiress, the synagogue, with him through faith in the power of God, who raised him from the dead. And when you were dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive together, and that's the aorist again, with him when he forgave us our trespasses. So with the aorist uses of the verbs, it is clear that the author of Colossians constructs a Paul saying something slightly different. Many commentators explain this different eschatology as an elaboration of Paul's teachings. However, is this present realized sort of resurrection in Colossians something that was just a simple elaboration? I'm not convinced by that. I don't understand why you would change it if it's simply just elaborating it slightly. So why differ from one's received tradition in Paul? Uh, in this paper, which I don't have a whole lot of time to go into the details, but I'll just throw a theory, or it's not, it's not really a new theory, but it might be the first time you guys have heard it, in which case it will sound new. I suggest that this production of Paul and reconstruction of the past is due to the death of Paul and the related delayed perusia. It is the shifting present that made it necessary for the author of Colossians to construct and promote an image of Paul where his teaching is no longer based on an imminent eschatology. With Romans 6, belief in resurrection became intimately tied to the powerful identity forming ritual of baptism. As such, belief in a future resurrection was understood by the author of Colossians to be based on a mentality that expected an imminent return and thus an end. What this did not allow for, though, however, is ethical rules for family life, household codes, or importance, which are both important sections within Colossians and its Deuteropoline cousin, Ephesians. Within this new present experience, Paul's silence on this matter is not adequate. The group must know how to live, and what does it mean to be in Christ, in a reality that is not apocalyptic with an imminent end, but is rather, no, is, you know, they're here to stay, sort of thing, for a while. This is perhaps best seen by looking at the alternative ways that other Pauline texts and their traditions uh, focus on resurrection. So here I use um, Peter Corney's uh, model that he, I think, is extremely helpful for looking at uh, Pauline traditions in a snapshot. Uh, he provides us a helpful graphical representation of the development of the Pauline tradition. It helps point out a very important aspect of early Pauline traditions after his death. 
When the undisputed letters of Paul are compared to Colossians, or to the pastoral letters, there is a lot of continuity, and the differences are usually small. However, when Colossians is compared to the pastorals, and I would put 2 Thessalonians here as well, there are many contradictions, particularly in our case on resurrection and the view of the parousia. Where Colossians posits a realized resurrection, pastoral Paul, or the Paul of the pastorals, warns that some blasphemers are saying that the resurrection already happened. 2 Timothy 2, 17-18 says, I quote, Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have swerved from the truth by claiming that the resurrection has already taken place. They are upsetting the faith of some, end quote. Similar to 2 Tim Tim Timothy, sorry, 2 Thessalonians 2, 1-2 speaks against what appears to be happening again also in Colossians and Ephesians. I quote, As to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we beg you, brothers and sisters, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as though from us to the effect that the day of the Lord is already here. End quote. 2 Timothy retains the continuity with the Pauline view of the future resurrection, and 2 Thessalonians retains the hope of an imminent parousia, both of which Colossians disagrees with. There is no parousia urgency in Colossians. As compared to the pastorals, Colossians reflects connections uh, more to wisdom traditions, and commentators have noted connections to even to the Gospel of John. This is an area worth exploring more, but a quick look can show that in John's prologue, with the pre-existence of Christ, and the Colossian Christ hymn, where Christ is the firstborn of all creation. Whereas the pastoral letters, such as 1 Timothy 2.5, Christ is stated to be a human only, which obviously could be going against the, um, uh, Docetists and other different uh, early Christian sort of enemies or um, apostates, but in this case it could also be aimed at Colossians. Uh, Another point of difference is Colossians 2, verse 8, where the audience is warned not to be taken captive by human tradition. Whereas in 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, they hold perhaps the opposite that they're to keep away from those not keeping the tradition. In conclusion, like Paul, who both retained continuity with his past and deviated from it based on his experience with the risen Christ, Colossians 2 retains ideas and concepts received from Paul. But the present experience of a failed parousia and the likely death and absence of Paul led to a new context that both required a different view of Paul's teaching on resurrection as well as an opportunity to speak for the apostle and thus pseudopigraphal production. And thus the pseudopigraphal production. The dead don't speak, their reputation is more or less stable. Attaching connected memories to an authority from the past is a pretty secure way to stabilize identity within uncertain times. The author of Colossians, as a pseudepigraphal work, intentionally sought to utilize Paul to promote a particular view of resurrection. As the Corny notes, the resurrection passage in Colossians 2 is the central teaching and moment of the letter. I don't think this is by accident. As a reputational entrepreneur, the author promotes an image of Paul that is in accord with his and his group's present needs. As Paul Connerton notes, I quote, whatever is written and more generally whatever is inscribed demonstrates by the fact of it being inscribed a will to be remembered. End quote. And to repeat Jan Asman's words again, pseudepigraphal writings are a legitimate strategy in the battle of memories. End quote. Past events are remembered and shaped in order to create identity. Resurrection was a significant boundary marker for Christian identity. It expresses who was in and who was out. As A.P. Poo states, I quote, Social boundaries are not inherent, they are constructed. Defining who belongs to a certain category of people often comprises negotiation and reevaluation. When circumstances change, this is, done. this is likely to have an impact on social categorization." End quote. After Paul's death, his views on resurrection took on an afterlife of their own. With each successive generation and their different interests and concerns and hopes from previous generations, uh, new Pauline images were produced and received and produced often as the needs of the present changed. Colossians is but one unique example of this process. Thank you. Uh. I would like to speak about the translation of Colossians, but I don't do that now. Okay. Uh, two major points. Um, the first thing you have this thesis: Paul's production of resurrection is constructed in light of his encounter with the risen Christ. I would say yes, but I would add, and then also the question whether you agree, 
Uh, you can turn the same thing around, of course. You, you trust uh, his, uh, you, you describe his encounter with the recent crisis if it were something like an, an objective thing, which is not also something which he has to construct. <laughs> so the point is you can turn the sentence around. Uh, Paul's idea of his experience, of his Damascus experience, interpreted as uh, an encounter with the recent Christ must have to do also with his ideas about resurrection before. Mm -hmm. Just perhaps a little point. Yeah. But the, th the second point is perhaps the real question. Um, the the Aspen quotation. So epigraphical writings are a legitimate strategy in the battle of memories. I would say yes, sometimes. But what about, uh, for example, the pseudo Clementines? Pseudo-Clementines, uh, which are perhaps not at the same level of a pseudo-epigraphical text, but is it legitimate um, to construct an image of Paul in the Battle of Memories, where he is something like a Judas figure? I mean, like you have it in the pseudo-Clementines. Pseudo yeah. Uh, so, uh, you have not just the New Testament pseudo-epigraphy, but you have outside, or, or do you have is it le legitimate to construct an image of Paul who was something like a dull friend of Seneca? By Seneca, a very dull writer of very bad Latin text. In, if you have the, the, the text between the encounters between Seneca and Paul constructed in the early Middle Ages, where you say, oh, yeah. what kind of Latin is this? Yeah, I don't know if I'm in a position to argue one way or the other on whether or not it's legitimate, I guess, in that sense. Um, yeah, I feel like I'm in a difficult, but I think what it, I think what the quote kind of shows is more that it's a legitimizing action, mm -hmm. that a pseudo biblical work, when you write something and it's obviously, uh, as you see in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the writings that come from Moses, and it's obvious that uh, that he's not around anymore, but it's an act of trying to legitimize, I think, more than maybe I can argue with or not. It's a legitimate move on their part, um, interpretively or exegetically. So, yeah, I don't, yeah. Um, does that answer? Yeah. No. Sure. Could talk longer. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> I think we're going to go to a pub after, right? Yeah, what about the encounter of Paul's encounter with, with Paul? First question. Oh, Paul's encounter with his own yeah. experience. Yeah, um, I think that's obviously constructed as well. Um, I think that's what we do, that's where we find our group identities, is essentially. Um, uh, as Benedict Anderson talks about communities are, or nations actually, he's talking about nations, but they're imagined, they're not, they're constructed, kind of like Lady Group says at the end, um, we don't discover a community as much as it's constructed, and we find ourselves within them. So for Paul, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know how to go about responding to his experience, but all I know is from Galatians and his personal sort of autobiographical testimony to it, um, is that it seemed to change him, and it seemed to change his entire yeah. way of looking at reality. Um, and so I just, yeah, I just took that as an assumption that it must have happened to him. Or yeah, but, but the point is not that they say it, it, it didn't happen. <laughs> the point is, uh, we, will, we will have in a few hours also a construction of our talk now. Right. Uh, but it happened. <laughs> but but we, will, we will construct it in different ways, so, so if we have to talk about this talk, yeah. So the idea is not that the encounter did not happen, but Paul had to make sense of what happened to him. Yes. So defined Galatians is already a construction. No, I totally agree. That's yeah. I, I, I yeah. found your point about the Damascus Road interesting, how you threw that in as a maybe a frame. I don't know. Yeah, perhaps. <laughs> Which is not in the autobiographical letter. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good frame. Any other questions? Yes, sir. <laughs> um, uh, maybe you can help me as a novice to uh, memory studies. And uh, I mean, I've just dabbled, right, uh, and learning a, a great deal. It's very abstract, it's very philosophical for me. Uh, but just taking on Osman's uh, comment up there, uh, I, I think he's probably right. But uh, again, just to help me understand the people who write memory studies, is this right because it's asserted to be right? That theoretically, pseudepigraphy are legitimate strategies? Uh, and how do we determine that? 
was it considered a legitimate strategy uh, in the first century? I mean, I know there are many Christians in the current tradition who would forcibly disagree with that. Yeah. So how do we determine uh, what are legitimate or what are illegitimate strategies? Uh, I mean, it's conceivable that a, a pseudographical writing could be uh, illegitimately done, but it's successful. Yeah. That it's successful. So how, how do we make those determinations on legitimacy of To be honest, I, I, I don't know if that's our place, in a sense, but it, or at least within um, social memory studies, at least. Uh, but, yeah, it, it is. It's... Um, Obviously, a pseudepigraphal writing, I think if the audience knew that it was pseudepigraphal, they probably wouldn't have gotten anywhere. And I think you can see that within the formation of the canon. No one who was putting it in or thought that Colossians or Ephesians, I don't think they're even doubted by anyone. So, um, I think they were taken to be legitimate in that sense. But the act of constructing the past, and in this way, it's, I think pseudepigraphy more than anything else, is a good example of an obvious intentional act of trying to rewrite the past. Um, Osman also talks about rewritten scripture within this framework as well. I wonder if you're both waving. I wonder if you're both losing sight of what the what it actually says, which is not a comment about whether the pseudepigraphal writings are legitimate, but that pseudepigraphy is a legitimate strategy. Yeah. And 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 I wonder if the, the the defensibility in that is is that um, how common it is. It, everybody is doing this, it seems. So, so that must make it. They must have felt that it was a legitimate way to go about making a point or asserting a um, asserting a memory. Yeah. Yeah. Or could it be a? Uh, I mean, I'm thinking in Second Temple literature where you have. Uh, First scenic or testaments of Adam, which of course everyone rec or they may, they may not recognize as obviously pseudonymous, and then perhaps pseudonymity with Paul, Deutero Paul, might come to be accepted yeah. on that kind of growing scale. Yeah, I mean, and with Colossians, it's, I didn't get to get into this as much, but. Um, I think he goes through great pains, whoever the author is goes through great pains to make this look like a genuine Pauline letter. If it is pseudepigraphal, again, I took that as an assumption to move forward, but if it is pseudepigraphal, then you got the signature at the end, you know, the autobiographical, Paul writing in his own hand. Uh, even choosing Colossae as a city sounds like it's the backwater area that who can contest whether or not the letter was actually from there. Um, there's things like that that make it seem like this was, this was meant to. Uh, sorry, it was meant to deceive. It was meant to trick in those ways. It's falsified in that sense. But, um, but they were going through it. This is a way of constructing the past. And I'm not sure how it's very different from other ways that we reconstruct the past. Professor Pokorny? Yes, I have also some problems with the philosophy of asthma. It's clear that uh, it's time to support some ideas by pseudepigraphy. Uh, the uh, example you mentioned from my uh, commentary to Croatians uh, mm -hmm. is uh, just a good, a good uh, illustration since it, uh, it concerns to a uh, canonized uh, pseudepigrapha. Right. Uh, but still my intention was To make the reader aware of the fact that to understand its pseudepigrapha, it's necessary to go through Paul and uh, to interpret it through the eyes of the Paul himself. Mm -hmm. Then it's of course uh, reasonable. It's reasonable to say that you are already uh, uh, sitting on the right of God and uh, reason from that. In the, uh, in the position, in the, the situation in which some people uh, said uh, you have to fulfill some uh, some uh, uh, cultic uh, mm -hmm. uh, to do some 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 cultic steps, and, 
And uh, on the other hand, uh, those who say that the resurrection is, uh, has already happened are uh, heretics, is in fact uh, necessary in, the, in a situation where the people uh, suppose we are already safe and uh, we can do what we do. But I intended to say that there is still one, uh, one truth. Right. Uh, which uh, has to be reached by, by, uh, by a comeback of, uh, of the original uh, author, which uh, the epigrapher uh, supposed to, 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 to uh, uphold or speak in his name. Right. Yeah. So, uh, if I'm understanding correctly, you're saying that uh, pseudepigraphal works are legitimate insofar as they retain the essence of the one that they're mm -hmm. pseudonymously writing on behalf of. But if it strays from that, then it's illegitimate. Mm -hmm. um, what shall we do with second people in this case? Yeah, I mean, from a social network perspective, I think, or even from, I guess, the, the assumptions I'm carrying, Um, even Colossians is, in a sense, changing, or at least the, any sort of production of the past, any sort of construction of the past, is already going to be altering it. So, I mean, obviously some people do it far more than others. Um, some of the examples we gave earlier are like that. But, yeah, I think that's, I, th this is more of a, this is what happens, I guess, with tradition figures. Uh, symbols, of individuals become symbols for cultural authority, I think people battle over them. And I think what Osman's getting at is that pseudepigraphy is one of these strategies in, that are used in the ancient world, probably nowadays too, um, to construct identities and then therefore control the past. And by controlling the past is the sense where uh, you can then start making claims on what the future should hold. So, um, yeah, so I'm not sure how to um, gauge, ethically speaking, what counts as legitimate or illegitimate uh, pseudepigraphies. But are you talking about lines of continuity or discontinuity? Lines of continuity or discontinuity? Yes, there is. Uh, in some cases, there is discontinuity. Uh, in in the Clementine novels, right, or appears uh, like Judas, or in the Gnostic poor, right, in Agamemnon. Uh, in such cases, it's necessary to say, no, that's not poor. It, uh, it may help to express some ideas, but it's not poor. Mm -hmm. yes. yeah. yeah, I just I would maybe like to follow up to what Craig said. I guess that should the geography in a second type of Judaism or second type of Jewish literature is something slightly different. Because, mm -hmm. well, let me start by saying that let's imagine that even nowadays there are religious societies and communities which are not that uh, influenced by Western hermeneutics and uh, are not that eager to always uncover the historical truth. Like it's not necessary to uncover the historical Moses behind the, some pseudo background of Moses. It's these type of communities are more interested in uh, like. It, the traditions are sort of like full of meaning. It's like it's all there, and it's, and, and, and when it's uh, attributed to Moses, it's just another like strand of meaning. Like it, it can help you to understand the story if you remember. Okay, the Moses from the from Genesis. You just put it there. Even even I don't know some maybe uh, some Eastern tradition nowadays. They just believe in. They just believe in the religious practices and, and ideology. And having all this tradition in some sort of, I would say, full of meaning. It's, it's all there, it's present, and they don't necessarily need to differentiate whether this is the, the, the authentic one or the authentic one, traditional history coming from them and that. It just, it just works somehow together. It's more, more or less synchronically, and all these attributions work as a, an added strength of meaning. But I would say it's completely different from, uh, or, mostly different from what we see in uh, uh, Deuteropolina, 
Yes, as Professor Cochrane said, I believe that there is importance of this sort of continuity. And it's not, and, and while you also look into the whole, the meaning is not, well, no, I mean, it's too much. I, I just wonder what's driving the importance. Yes, yes. Well, what I wanted to say is that it's always important to sort of cultural memory here. Because you, you see that in the second century BCE, there was probably some understanding who Enoch or who Moses or who whoever else was. There was some sort of interpretation of who was Solomon, for example. You can see that Solomon immediately became not only a the wise man, but also as a sort of a, the first mage of the Jewish tradition or something like that. So this, this is a part of cultural memory. So when you, when you read the Sudapika from the second century, this is a sort of understanding framework for reading the text, not the question like, oh, we know that this is not written from all this. This, this. Yeah, I, I think there are a good distinction between Arinarin and uh, Gedeikness is even important. Yeah, but I'm not sure if they but we can were interested in Arinarin. Arinarin. They're, they're not. Yes. Yeah, it's all one. Yeah. Nice. But I'm taking over here, that's not good. Um, any other questions? Perhaps we just have a few minutes more. I think, uh, on the whole, and I think this is the point of the discussion, uh, there is a broad range of not just of point epigraphy in the ancient world. Uh, you have even school exercises where people have to train to write in the way of how this guy did or so. This is a totally different way of point epigraphy, like this point epigraphy which I have in the Pauline letters, and even in the Pauline letters you have different, I would say, different approaches to Paul. Yeah. And then you have uh, Second Temple literature, but you have also works attributed uh, to Galenus, where we have, where we have full collections of them. Or, so I think this is a, such a broad phenomenon that one has to be careful and to, to, to always look what kind of show do I have, what kind of situation, and then I can look what kind of strategy no, I appreciate it. Okay, uh, two yes. quick questions, and I'm hearing a stomach scribbling, so there's you know, supper time soon, right? Yeah, I was just throwing out an idea coming again from Old Testament side to see how it plays in the New Testament. Because I, I mean, there's a lot of pseudonymity going on in the Old Testament, but from the Old Testament side, I see it more as patronage. So to have Lithavid and a psalm superscript is it's not to say that David wrote it, but it's honoring David as the patron of psalmody. His temple, first temple was his idea, we honor him. And it also has a secondary function of kind of authorizing that Lithavid psalm as an authorized psalm, we can use that in temple. And so I see the same thing taking place with the priestly writer where things were so Leviticus uh, and, Yah and Yahweh said to Moses uh, that to legitimize priestly ideology in the exilic post exilic period is connected to, to Moses as a way of honoring. So it's not a way of being duplicitous, it's a way of honoring the forebears. Right. So I'm wondering, could that apply in New Testament, that here we see Paul as the the Apostle of Christ, this is a way of honoring it's not... Oh, yeah, yeah, I don't think they're trying to... Yeah. Like with Colossians, I don't see any attempt to dishonor Paul. Um, and neither is First Timothy, neither is Second Timothy. Like, they're all trying to honor Paul, but I don't know if they're trying to let it be known that they're writing on behalf of Paul. Like, I don't know, from Colossians at least, just thinking of that specifically right now, it's just, there's too many things that seem like they're trying, the author's trying to make this seem like Paul genuinely wrote it. Mm -hmm. And to me it raises, it's an, but like, yeah, it's, it's a question why to be so, like, it gets past the pseudepigraphal and yet the author is doing it on purpose. Mm -hmm. So it's just a curiosity. Yeah. 